means forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns forevermore. And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this last day of September. My, where has 2018 gone? Uh, I just can't, we're going to see Christmas trees out before long. They may already be out. But we're glad you're with us on this Sunday morning. Uh, We certainly appreciate your watching and telling others about it. And uh, we're we're in a very interesting interesting uh, study, and that is not a an, uh, not a casual look at the Word of God, as the announcer says, but an in depth study. And I want you to open your Bibles to First Corinthians, and we're going to talk about these sixteen chapters, and then we're going to get as far as we can, and uh, in the time that we have on this Sunday morning. I appreciate your watching. I I don't know where you are, and what your situation is, but I'm praying for you. I pray for abundant living. I pray for you every day. And I hope you pray for me. I hope you pray for the program that it might reach people that want to be taught. You know, you, you son, I, in fact, I read it in this, Powerful Today. It says there, sometimes a coach talks about a, uh, a player that's coachable. And then we talk about children that are teachable. In other words, that, that, that's that special time when they open their minds, when they want to be taught, when the, maybe when they ask questions and they want to know what's the meaning of this. You know, we have so many of those in the Bible that's interesting. When the Ethiopian eunuch said, uh, of whom speaketh this prophet, of himself or somebody else? And the Bible says that Philip, the preacher, took from this very passage and preached unto him Jesus. Well, what, where was he reading? He was reading from Isaiah 53. One of the greatest chapters in the Bible, the Messianic chapter about the coming of Christ. And so uh, that's what we're talking about. When, when I offered this Bible that so many of you were so kind to uh, let me know that you wanted one, we've given away nearly 150 of them. And uh, I, what I'm doing is taking what you've said to me when you wrote in or called in and said, I want one of the Bibles, but I don't know how to read it. I don't know where to go. I'm in a situation and I need some guidance. You know, James chapter 1 verse 5 says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all liberally, liberally and abradeth not. In other words, he'll give you what you've asked for. Now then, let's get back to power for today. Uh, of course, we will have our first Sunday coming up in October, and that's what this is. This is a little old daily devotional. It's the best thing, I, but it's really power because it's the Word of God. It's a scripture and then a paragraph written by a, a Christian, and then there's a song and a, and a prayer. This is perfect for family devotions. And I don't know of anything that's more important for our families today than to have a family devotion. Maybe in the morning before everybody gets started, everybody's running, trying to get ready, I know. It may be that you personally could uh, benefit from it by having read it on, on the uh, noonday or maybe at night. Maybe you're a night person and Cut the TV off and, and find your place. I, and when, I, when I talk to people about the Scriptures, uh, you need a time, you need a place, and you need a method. So you pick out those three things, and you will be surprised how this power, which is the gospel of Christ, Romans 1.16, will change your life. It will do what God intended for it to do, and that is to make us 
uh, servants of the Lord. I like that word. I like that word. I know it's a turnoff for a lot of people, but that's what they were. Most of them were in the New Testament day. They were servants, and they had masters, and they were told how to uh, treat their masters, and the masters were told how to treat their slaves. So when we understand the Bible, who wrote it, to whom was it written, and uh, under what circumstances? I think that helps us in uh, understanding what God wants us to know from His Word. We started out last week by saying uh, our problem, here's our problem in the church, out of the church, in a lot of churches. Uh, You do do err. You are in error because you don't know the Scriptures nor the power of God. You're forever limiting God. There's a little book out. I've forgotten the author's name. It says... uh, your, your God is too small. And I think that's a problem sometimes. We, we limit God. Uh, we, we, we know that God in the Scripture has a lot of um, images. In other words, Isaiah 59 says, The hand of the Lord is not shortened, that He cannot reach, nor His ear heavy. God doesn't have a hand, literally. God is a spirit, John 4.24. So we try to understand God, but we understand through Jesus Christ that He's our Heavenly Father and that He will not put more on us than we can bear, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And so we just, we need power for today. So call in, 881-4651. I'll mail you your copy this week and uh, you read it. You'll be blessed by it. Now open your Bibles. We're walking through 1 Corinthians. We've dealt with the gospel. We've dealt with the book of Acts. We talked about the book of Romans. And now we're going to walk through uh, quickly 1 Corinthians because I want to get to 2 Corinthians before our time is up this morning. So if you have your Bible, maybe one of the new ones we gave you, uh, please open it and let's just kind of walk through. Paul begins by, uh, by being thankful. Now, he's writing to a church that's got more problems in it than any church I know. I don't know of a church anywhere that has the problems that the church in Corinth had. And so Paul starts out by his usual way, and that is uh, and Paul called uh, by the will of God to be an apostle of, of Christ Jesus, our brother, Sosthenes, uh, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. And that sanctified just means set apart. Just Christians. The word saint. It doesn't mean super Christian. It just means Christian. And so, a uh, call to be saints uh, together with all those who are in every place called upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, both the Lord and ours. Grace and peace be unto you. Then he gives a thanksgiving, and then he presents a problem. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the church of Corinth, reading this letter now from Paul, that, that all of you agree that there be no division among you, that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe, people, that, that there is quarreling among my brethren. What I mean is that each one of you say, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Christ, or, or Peter, or I follow Christ. Now listen to this. Is Christ divided? You know, that's a rhetorical question. It carries its own answer. Uh, you have divided the body of Christ because you're following men instead of the Lord. And he says, is Christ divided? He's not supposed to be. Oh, he goes on to say, was Paul crucified for you? Did Paul get on the cross and when he died, was Paul's, uh, history says Paul's, uh, Paul's death was brought about by be, being beheaded. And so he says, was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Paul didn't want anybody following him. He wanted people following Christ. And one of the problems 
at the church of Corinth was the fact that there was a lot of men's wisdom. He deals with this in the first chapter, that there was a lot of wisdom of men in the world, and it had crept into the church. He says, the foolishness of God is wiser than man. But there are some people that get to the point where they think they're smarter than God. And they don't need to follow God. They don't need to follow what God has said in His Word. And so then Paul says, now the problem with Corinth is you're divided. Chapter 2, he said, are you not carnal? Do you not walk after the manner of men? It's so easy to follow men, isn't it? But then it isn't long until we're discouraged and disappointed. Because one of my mentors told me years and years ago that all men have clay feet. All men. So we dare not follow man. And that's a, if you understand the first chapter, then you understand why there were so many sins in the church. Because they weren't following Christ. If you'd follow Christ, you'd deal with it. And that's what he wrote in Second Corinthians and told them they, what they needed to do. You need to deal with these sins. And so then, but here's a, here's a point I want to make here about how you become a Christian. You see, there's so many sidelines in reading the Scriptures. Uh, Paul says, uh, were you crucified? Did, did Paul die for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Then you don't belong to Paul. What's the opposite of that? Christ died for us. Yes. He tasted death for every man, Hebrews 2 and 9. He tasted death for every man, everybody. And were you baptized in the name of Christ? Yes, they were in Acts chapter 2 and verse chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 16. Were you baptized in the name of Christ? Yeah, then you belong to Christ. So in the very first chapter, he talks about the matter of division and the wisdom of men and the division in the church. And then a chapter 5 is a very upsetting chapter because it's about a man. He said that they're in the church now, in, in, in the body of Christ there. There's a man that's living with his father's wife. Most of us have concluded that's his stepmother. And he said, this is not even reported among the Gentiles. Nothing has been under attack more in the recent years than marriage by men, by the Supreme Court, by the media, by, by man. That's, that, that says it. Just like when they asked Jesus about the baptism of John, they said, is it from man or is it from God? That's all there is. And Jesus uh, are, and then he asked them rather that, and they said, well, if we say it's from men, they'll stone us. And then if we say it's from God, then he'll say, why don't you do it? Why don't you obey it? So chapter 6 is about immorality. Chapter 7 is about going to law with brethren and, uh, and other instructions about. The sixth chapter is very good because at the end of it, he says, flee sexual immorality. Each, uh, every other sin uh, a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, wherein ye whom ye have from God, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Folks, that's a sermon within itself. I mean, look at, look at our situation today regarding the way we treat our body. The way, and we fail, we fail to realize that the Lord wants us to use our body to fulfill the commands of God. And uh, he says, you, you just use it for the wrong reason. You use it to satisfy your own lustful flesh. And then he talks about marriage in the seventh chapter. And that's when sexuality comes in, and that's when he says that, that you know, that uh, he was talking about it's better to marry than to burn. 
And he said, by that he meant to burn with desire and have sexual activity outside of marriage, which is against God's will. And so the seventh chapter is about that. And then the eighth chapter is about uh, the weak brother, the strong brother, the food that's been sacrificed to idols. And uh, that's a, that was a very difficult problem back then because, you see, for a long time, people would take, those who were in paganism would have animals and they would go to the temple and they would sacrifice these animals uh, unto their pagan gods. And then a couple of days later, the remains of that animal would be in the market for sale. And this hurt the conscience of those who had come out of uh, that type of worship because people were buying those animals and eating them for food. Eating food, eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. So that's discussed in the 8th chapter. And uh, Paul's writes in the ninth chapter. And chapter 10 is an excellent chapter talking about the children <clears throat> the children of Israel, how that they sinned, that what it, like in Romans uh, 15 and verse 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says, These things happened to us by way of an example, that we should not lust as they lusted, and fell in that day three and twenty thousand. But one of the real encouraging verses is cha in chapter 10, in verse 12 and 13, he says, For there's no temptation taken you, but such as man can bear. For God will with the temptation also provide a way of an escape. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that, isn't that so encouraging? Because I see people that are just inundated with difficulty. It's what I call a cluster. A cluster is a number of bad things happens to you in a short period of time. And you don't, <clears throat> you don't get time to resolve that one until you're hit by another. I know recently of a, a lady that lost her father. Um, and then it, about two, about a week later, her husband passed away. Well, that precious soul is in a cluster. And she hasn't had time to grieve over losing her father, to whom she was very close. And, of course, she was married to her husband for 40-something years. And so she loses her father and her husband within 10 days. Well, that woman is going to need a lot of comfort, a lot of understanding, a lot of patience. And because I learned a long time ago, nothing will challenge your faith like pain and like suffering because one of the first things that we uh, fall into is we, we start saying, Lord, what a, we're kind of like Job's friends. Job's friends came to him and said, Job, you must have been a bad fellow because of these bad things that have happened to you. And that wasn't it at all. And so it, that, that, that was incongruent. And so he said, that's, that's not the problem. And so bad things do happen to us, and they happen in sometimes in a short period of time, and we don't get to resolve them until another one hits us. So we got this verse in verse 12 that I know some people who have been through that find it hard to believe because they think, well, I just might as well give up. I just might as well give up because uh, the, the harder I try to live right, the more difficult it becomes. But he says here, there's no temptation taking you. You won't be in a situation that you cannot bear it. For God is faithful. I don't think I quoted that correctly a while ago. God is faithful. Who will with the temptation provide a way of an escape? See, to be tempted is not to sin. Jesus was tempted. We, we talked about this last a couple of weeks ago. To be tempted is normal. To be tempted means you're trying to live right. And it's only when we give in to that temptation. It's only when we say yes instead of no. It's only when we say nobody cares, nobody will ever know it, or any other way we have of justifying it. And so he says there's no temptation taking you. 
the Lord won't put more on you than you can bear. And I know there have been times when maybe all of us have wondered whether or not that's true. But the key to that verse is there's a way to get out of it. There's a way to deal with it. There's a way to uh, uh, to cope with it. I love the word coping, and I, I do a lot of, try to do a lot of encouragement and counseling to those who have lost loved ones. And you won't get over it, but you'll get through it. And that's what we, that, that's what I think Paul is saying here, that there will be help for you. There is help for you. If, if you want to know about God, read the Psalms. Read the Psalms, and um, that will give you a picture of God that you probably never had before. Chapter 12 is about spiritual gifts. There were nine of them. And these were things that the apostles were able to give to members of the church to use to the glory of God and the advancement of the cause of Christ. Now, the problem was of the nine spiritual gifts, the tongue speaking uh, became the most uh, admirable of all of them. It, in other words, if you had that gift, then you were more spiritual than everybody else. And Paul says that's not true. He said, he said uh, you just, just read the 12th chapter and it will set your mind straight on the spiritual gifts and why they were given. And then isn't it interesting that the very next chapter is the greatest chapter in the Bible on love. Uh, he said where in, in this 13th chapter, he said where there have been things given in part, they shall be done away. That was the spiritual gifts because they couldn't pass them on to anybody else because they were not apostles. The apostles can lay their hands on whomsoever they desired, but on those people, they could not pass it on to somebody else because they were not apostles. And so the 13th chapter of of 1 Corinthians is the greatest chapter in the Bible on love because he says love is a verb. Love is action. Love is doing. Love is not chill bumps. Love is not Hollywood. Love is not an emotion per se. It's an emotion that follows action. I feel better after I have done right. And when I do what's right, then my emotion is love. Or love can be my motivation. There are three kinds of motivation, fear, reward, and love. We raise our children for the first couple of years on fear. Don't stick a screwdriver and a, and a uh, plug in the wall. Don't take medicine out of the medicine cabinet. Don't get in the driveway. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because we say no. I was talking to a grandmother the other day, and they said, we're trying to teach our grandchild the meaning of the word no. And uh, sometimes that takes a quite uh, a task. No means don't do it. And so we motivate them by no. And then we... As the child grows older, we change that to reward. If you do what you're supposed to be doing, then you'll be rewarded. Then as that child matures, like we hope that he will or she will, then they do things out of love. They do it because it's the right thing to do. And that's what Paul says, if I give my body to be burned, can you imagine, you know, hearing about a, a Christian that, and when you read about the New Testament Christians, so many of them were burned at the stake. They were made, I read the other day, they were made as candles in the garden of Nero. Burned Christians as human candles. And so Paul says, if I give my body to be born, if I sell all my goods and give it to the poor, but have not love, it profits me nothing. And in the Greek, that word nothing means zero. And so here we've got to get back to understanding the meaning of love, the power of love. Um, and and Paul, uh, the Lord dealt with this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you love those that love you, what reward have you? The Gentiles do that. Or the Pharisees do that. It's easy to love somebody that loves you. 
That's normal. In fact, in 1 John, he talks about it. He said, we ought to love God because God loved us first. And so when we realize this matter of love, if I give my body to be burned, if I do all of these good things, he says, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Oh, boy. <laughs> love is kind. And we, it's so easy to say it. I love you. But it's so challenging to do it because it has to do with behavior. And he says, it's, it, it takes no account of evil. It doesn't have a long list of everything you've done wrong. And, uh, of course, the most popular verse in the, in the Bible is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And we are so limited because of our English. The word so is an adverb of degree telling how much. Well, how much? Well, just so much. Well, enough that he would give his only begotten son for your sins and mine. And so we could spend a month on the 13th chapter of Romans. And then he talks about the, uh, the uh, matter of speaking in tongues. And that goes back to verse uh, chapter 12. You read chapter 12, then you put it in perspective in chapter 13, and then read chapter 14. Chapter 15 is an excellent chapter on the resurrection of Christ. He starts out by saying, The gospel that I preached unto you, wherein you now stand, if you hold fast that which I preached unto you, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised again. So that's the gospel. Don't change it. Don't add to it. Just obey it. And then he goes into a discussion on the resurrection. Chapter 16 closes out with just some encouragement and uh, final instructions, and he says in that verse, uh, in verse 55 of the 15th chapter, of uh, verse 58 rather, wherefore my beloved brethren, those of you who want to do right, and I think this is true of all the churches, that there are those that want to follow the Lord, they may have been mistaken because they may have been following man. Like Acts 5, 29, Paul says, we must obey God rather than man. And so when you read the Bible, see, it's not like Facebook. I said that last week. Facebook, uh, what little I look at it, it's always smiling and wonderful pictures of grandchildren and great-grandchildren and grandma and grandpa and everybody's having a big time at Disney World. That's not the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God that tells the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? He found out what truth was. It's everything God has said. And if you haven't become a Christian, I wish you'd read Acts 8, and I wish you'd do just as they did. Repent, confess the name of Christ, be buried with Him in baptism, and to be raised to walk in a new life. Then you'll understand what God's Word's all about. Until next week, may God bless you as our prayer. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be